I am Anil Kumar. Welcome to my series on algebra. Now, this series has been prepared especially for our middle school students so that they can have a good foundation of algebra and transit to high school without any problems. So it is kind of bridging a gap between what you learn in middle school and what you need to know to move on to high school. It will prepare you for grade nine. Let me share with you the contents of today's lesson and then we'll elaborate on them. I hope you can see my screen. So we'll talk about the following topics. The very first one is prerequisites in which we'll consider the order of operation. I'll not get into the details of this particular topic. We have another video to cover for prerequisites for algebra. However, we'll just test it out. Do we remember all the concepts which are extremely important to understand algebra? We'll actually begin with some recursive and explicit pattern rules. We'll talk about variables which can be used to model real life situation. We'll explore formula usage. Arithmetic to algebra is very much connected. We'll like to see what is this connection between arithmetic to algebra. We'll also take a problem solving with examples. I'll discuss with you how do we solve a given problem using arithmetic approach and also how do we solve the same problem using algebraic approach. That would be great. I would like that during this discussion, you get and communicate with me so that we could actually understand one another better. So communication skills are very important. You need to participate actively as if you are attending a class in person with me. We'll in between have some practice questions. These questions will be colored as shown here in the brown color. You need to answer these questions on your own. Think about these strategies and work out a plan. I will also provide you with some assignments these assignments will ensure that you have understood all the concepts. At the end of the lesson, we'll have a project. The idea of the project is to apply all the concepts learned during today's lesson and then come out with the solution of the project. You can always make a model that will be a step ahead. And then after this, we'll look into what are algebraic expressions in the next session. So now let's begin with the very first chapter of this, which is what are arithmetic expressions and equations? Well, as mentioned here, arithmetic is the branch of mathematics that deals with the study of numbers with respect to combination of operations addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, and roots are the operations you are familiar with. In earlier classes, you have learned about the properties of these operations along with order of operation in evaluating expressions. So let's kind of review these concepts one by one, okay? So the very first one here is our example number one in which we need to evaluate the expressions. 4 plus 5 is what? Well, you know, 4 plus 5 is 9. We have introduced one more step in between to say 4 plus 5 is also 5 plus 4. Now, this is a very important concept. As you learn, commutative property of addition. So when we were doing algebra, we learned commutative property, associative property, distributive property, right? and many others, right? So you should recall all these properties while solving problems. It is good to communicate why we are doing this particular step and what is the property of the rule behind it. So when you add four and five, you could also add five and four, both give you the same result, which is nine. And this actually confirms with the commutative property of addition. 
Another example which we have taken is 7 minus 5 minus 3 whole square. Well, here we'll apply the order of operation. Well, some of you call it in short bed mass or some PEMDAS. Well, bracket, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction is for bed mass and parenthesis exponents. Multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction for bed mass, right? One and the same thing. The critical thing to understand here is when in an expression you have division and multiplication, then they are of the same order. You could do either one of them, right? So now, what could be the rule? Well, when you have division and multiplication, the rule is simple. You should go from left to right. Does it make sense, right? So that is how it should be followed. Similarly, if you have addition and subtraction, the rule is move from left to right. You get the idea, right? So here we have 7 minus 5 minus 3 whole square. To solve this, we have to first solve what is within the bracket. 5 minus 3, which is 2. Well, square 2, that is the exponent, take away from 7 to get 3. 7 minus 4 is 3, and that becomes our answer. Is that clear to you? Perfect. Now, let's take up the next example, which is 1 plus 4 times 5 divided by 2. Of course, there are no brackets. So we are going to look into what is there apart from brackets and exponents. Well, it is multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Correct. So we have these three terms right there, 4 times 5 divided by 2. What should be done first? Well, the order for multiplication and division is same, and therefore, we need to go from left to right. So first, we are going to multiply 4 and 5. That gives us 20. Divide that by 2 which gives us 10, right? So what we get here is 1 plus 10, and that results into 11. You get the idea. So that is how we have to evaluate the given expression. So basically, what we have done here is, when the order of operation was same, in that case, move from left to right. You get the idea, right? This is kind of important in understanding order of operation while evaluating arithmetic expressions. Now, here is a practice question for you. Question number one, insert parenthesis in equation. Now, the question is, use brackets with each expression on the left side to make the equation true. Now, when we talk about equation, it really means that we'll have an equal to sign. And on either side of the equal to sign, we have expressions. Both left side expression and the right side equation should be true for the equation to be true. Correct? Now, what do we have here? In A, we have 4 plus 2 plus 3 times 4 minus 1 should be equal to 23. Now, how can we make this equal to 23? If you follow the normal order of operation, you get what? You get 3 times 4, which is 12. And to 12, you are going to add some numbers and then subtract 1. It is not going to give you 23, for sure. That means you need to place brackets somewhere. Can you think about the position of the bracket so that you get 23 as your result? Take a moment. Think about it. Should I place the bracket between 3 and 4? Then 3 times 4, and it doesn't make sense, right? Or could we do bracket between 2 and 3? 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 times 4 is 20. That may give us the result. You get the idea. So the correct answer would be to put brackets right there. So if I have 4 plus within brackets, 2 plus 3 times 4 minus 1, I do get 23. You get the idea, right? So that is how placing brackets will give you a different result. And in this case, it is the required result. So that means that is the correct solution. Perfect. Now, 
take your time to answer part B, which is 3 times 2 plus 3 minus 2 squared equals to 27. Now, this question is very tricky. Think about it. How are you going to place the brackets to get the right hand side whose value is 27? Well, we have an option of squaring. Square what? Well, 3 minus 2 is just 1. Squaring 1 is not going to give you that large number. How about putting a bracket right there? 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 minus 2 is 3. Square is 9. And 9 times 3 is 27. So I think that should work. You get the idea. So now placing the bracket, we have 3 times within the bracket, 2 plus 3 minus 2, whole square, and that is equal to 12. So that becomes the right answer. So I hope you got the answer on your own also. You see that? So this is kind of a review of what you already know about arithmetic, how to evaluate the expressions, and how to solve or equate the equations. Correct? Let's move forward. Now we have question two, another question for you, a very interesting question. The whole idea of placing these questions here is for you to recall what you already know, right? So this time, find the missing numeral to make the equation true. Now the word numeral, what does that mean? Numeral is a symbol or a figure used to represent a known number, correct? A known number. That is what a numeral is, okay? So here, we'll figure out what is 13 minus n, where n is the numeral, equals to a. That means we need to figure out what is that number n, which when placed here, will make the equation true. You get the idea? Perfect. Think about it. We do have discussed the strategy to provide solution written here really means that you should discuss with your friends, with yourself, with your classmates, and with your teacher. How do we figure out the value of n? Now, in this particular case, it seems to be simple. 13 minus n equals to 8. What should be taken away from 13 to get the value of 8? Well, n should be equal to 5, right? That's very easy. You must have got it. Perfect. Next one here is 1 plus 6 minus a question mark. You have to fill in in that place. Square of that is 17. So what could be filled in there so that the left side is equal to the right side? Well, 1 plus something is 16, and that something is square, right? So 1 plus we know 16 is 17, but square of a number should be 16. That means inside should be 4. You get the idea how we are working on it? So I think that this question mark should be equal to 2. I'm not sure whether it is right or wrong, but you can think about it, right, and discuss. Fine. If I put 2 here, then I get 6 minus 2 is 4. Square of 4 is 16. And when you add 1, you do get 17. So that seems to be the right answer. Correct? Okay. Now let's take up the next one. P times 7 divided by 3 is 28. So we have times and division. First thing first, we have to multiply this. Then divide by 3 to get 28. Now how will we get this answer of 28? Well, 28 cannot be divided by 3. So it becomes slightly difficult. But well, 28 can be divided by 7, right? Yes. 28 can be divided by 7. 7 times 4 is 28. Now, can you get the answer now? 7 times 4 is 28. So what should be P? Think about it. What should be P so that we get 28? Should it be 4? Mm -mm. 28, then we have to divide by 3 also. That means it should be 4 times 3, right? It could be 12 because we want that number to be 4, right? So it could be 12. We are dividing the whole thing 
by 3. So P divided by 3, well, 12 divided by 3 is 4, and 4 times 7 is 28. You get the idea. So P should be 12. So that is how you could think and answer these questions. Now here are three very interesting questions for you. The very first one deals with fractions. Some of you will know them as rational numbers, right? Of the form of a number over a number, right? So we will not elaborate, we'll keep it simple so that all our middle school students understand what is this? One over three equals to one over four plus one over D. What should be the value of D? This is what we have to find. Well, guess and check. Or you could do this like one over D should be equal to what? It should be equal to one over three minus one over four, right? And solving this, you might get your answer, right? You will get your answer, I think so, correct? So I'd like you to try this question, perfect? And figure out what is the answer. Take your time. You should know how do we subtract fractions. To subtract fractions, we should have common denominator. Well, clearly, that should be 12. And then cross multiply 4 minus 3. And we get 1 over 12. Clearly, the value of D is now 12. You see that? So we do get the answer. And we can say, well, in this particular case, D is equal to 12. Well, I would like you to redo these questions so that you ensure that you understand these concepts. These are very important to move forward. Perfect. Now, another question here is with some exponents. For ease, I've taken 10 to the power of something. It's easy, right? 3 times 10 cubed plus 5 times 10 square plus 10 to the power of 0 is the whole number W. How do we find this number? Take your time and tell me the answer. Well, 10 cubed means 1,000, means this first number is 3,000, correct? 10 squared is 100 times 5 is 500, correct? Now, the question is, what is 10 to the power of 0? Is it 10? Is it 1? Is it 0? Hmm, that's difficult. Remember one thing. Anything to the power of zero is what? Anything to the power of zero is just one. And therefore, we get our number, which is 3501. You said 3501. So that becomes the value of W. We get the idea, right? Now, the last one here involves mixed numbers. So we have a whole number and a fraction. How do we add these numbers? To add these numbers, first, let us write them as improper fraction. Well, multiply 3 by 2, which is 6 plus 1 is 7. So we could write this as 7 over 2. The next number here is 1 times 3, which is 3, plus 2 is 5. We get 5 over 3. Now, to add, we'll take a common denominator, which is 3 times 2 is 6. You can cross multiply. 7 times 3 is 21 plus 5 times 2 is 10, and therefore, you get the value 31 over 6, and that should be the value for f. You get the idea. So that was a quick review on the basic arithmetic operations. We did take up some expressions, some equations, and we kind of worked with fractions or rational numbers to review these concepts. We also learned what are numerals. Well, Numeral is a symbol or a figure used to represent a known number. So what is important to understand here is that when we talk about arithmetic, we are always working with known numbers. See, all these numbers are known. Even that value of P is kind of a known number, but we have to figure it out, right? I could make a box there, fill in the blanks kind of thing, right? But these are the known numbers, right? Numerals are made with digits. So here, for example, when I say 27, it is a number which is the combination of 2 and 7, but gives us a value, 27. You get the idea. So numerals, the whole numbers especially, when we deal with, we are thinking about numbers from 0, 1, 2, 3, 
to 9, right? Combination of these numbers will give us the numerals. Well, numerals we also have in many other languages, which could be used. For example, the Roman numerals, right? You understand this letter, correct? 10, right? If I write anything after that, it is to be added. It becomes 15, for example, correct? But if I write something before this, then that gets subtracted, it becomes 14. So that kind of a picture, a figure, is also a numeral which represents a fixed number. So numerals are used in this fashion. I hope this definition of numerals is absolutely clear. Now, when we have understood about the basic operations which we learned in arithmetic, let's move forward and see some patterns. So here is a very interesting example for you. Can you please read this question? Take your time, read the question, understand, and try to solve. So let's focus on this. Example two is based on pattern rule for the triangular tiles. Well, the question is, extend the pattern of the triangles shown. So what is the pattern we have? Well, we have this. Let's call this as figure number one. In figure number one, we have one triangle. Now, in figure number two, we have added three here and it becomes a bigger triangle, which has those four small triangles. Do you see that? So we added to one, three number of triangles, correct? And then what happens? We added another row, basically, so that it fits it into another triangle. And that is our figure number three. This time, we added five more to the previous one. And now, how many do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, nine. So four plus five, which is nine. So we do have a pattern, a growing pattern, in which we get more and more number of triangles as we move on from third to the fourth to the fifth, and so on. The idea is to find a rule for finding the number of triangles in this pattern. Perfect. So the question here is part A, extend the pattern of triangles as shown. Just make a drawing for the fourth pattern. That means you're going to kind of extend this here, right? So what will you get? You will get seven triangles in addition. You get the idea, right? That is why the odd number of triangles are being added as we move on from one figure to the other. Well, now you understand the rule, so you can write the pattern rule based on what you observe. Well, let me tell you one thing. These observations are very important. What we do here is we use T-chart or a table in which we can record our observations, right? So first thing first, record observations. So once you record observation, you will be in a process to analyze and get to the rule. You get the idea, right? So that is our strategy. So we'll get the pattern rule. Once you find the pattern rule, you need to find the number of triangles in the fifth figure, right? So that means one more you have to add. You have to find the number of triangles in the fifth figure. Well, the next question is find the number of triangles in the 20th figure. 20th figure means Will you be making 20 such figures? Well, that is going to take the whole day, right? We'll have to figure out some other way of finding the answer for part D. Keeping that in mind, let's now again discuss this strategy. So whenever you have a question, it's important to take a pause and make a strategy to solve the question. Well, here is a strategy which I thought about to solve this pattern of triangles, right? First, we need to sketch the pattern. We need to do it. So let's sketch and figure it out. And then complete the T-chart and observe how the numbers are increasing, just as we recorded earlier, right? So now we know a T-chart is to be formed. Now, the T-chart could be vertical or a horizontal. In this particular case, I made a horizontal T-chart writing the figure numbers with the number of triangles. In figure number one, we have just one triangle. In the second figure, we have four, right? We have three more. So I've written here three more. Now, in the third figure, we have 
five more, and when you add five to four, we get nine triangles. Well, we did count them also. We got the number nine. Perfect. Now, when you do the fourth one, in that case, we know this row will have two more than earlier, five. So that means seven more, right? So seven, when added to nine, will give us 16. So in the fourth figure, we'll have 16 triangles. Now, you know, in the fifth figure, it should be how many? Well, earlier we added seven, this time two more than seven, which is nine. So when I add nine to 16, I get 25. And therefore, I get my first answer, which is the number of triangles in the fifth figure should be 25. Does it make sense to you? So that is how quickly we can actually get the answer for part A, B, and C. Well, did I define the pattern rule? Not yet, but we worked it out. You get the idea, right? We did work it out. Okay, so now let's take our time. Go back to question number one, which is how do we define a pattern rule? I'm calling this as rule A for the time being. Well, we started at three, right? And then what did we do? We add three, then add two more each time. Odd numbers are being added. You get, but in the first step, we added three. Now, that is kind of tricky. So definitely, it is not kind of add three each time. No, no, no. For the first time only, we added three, and thereafter, we added two each time. That makes it very tricky. Well, in any case, this does make a rule, right? It's good enough. So in middle school, normally, we'll write down a rule, which is something like this. Well, there is a name to such a rule, and it is called a recursive pattern rule. Why recursive pattern rule? Because we should know the starting number and then what is being done to continue the pattern, right? That means we should know every step to move on to the next step, right? So the previous number should be known so that we could add some number, get our result in the next step. Is that clear to you? Correct? So this is a recursive pattern where two is repeatedly added to find the next number. Well, but in that recursive, the first step is you start at one and add three. Correct? So properly, we have to write the rule. The rule is start at one, add three. Then now the question is, will you continue till the 20th figure? to find the number of triangles in the 20th figure? That's a big question, right? It is going to take the whole day as I said. Then how should you find a pattern rule so that we should not be actually making all the patterns one by one and counting the triangles? Well, now that brings us to the next level of thinking. So let's look into the relation between the figure number and the numbers. Well, we see if the figure number is one, then the number of triangles is one. When the figure number is two, the number of triangles is four. And when the figure number is three, the number of triangles is nine. For figure number four, the number of triangles is 16. For five, it is 25. So for 20, what should it be? You get the idea. Well, we see these are all the square numbers. You get the idea, right? So if this is a number, then that one is the square of that number. So what I could say is if the figure number is some number n, in that case, the number of triangles should be n squared. So in this case, it will be 400. You get the idea. So by looking at the pattern, we can also come out with a rule. And this kind of a rule is kind of a formula, right? From the figure number directly, we get the number of triangles. And that is called explicit pattern rule. So let's again look into this particular pattern rule. So here, what we saw earlier was that we did extend the pattern, write the pattern rule, which was recursive pattern rule, repeating, right? So after every number or the figure, you have to add two more, which you added last time, two more than last time, right? Now, we did get the answer for the number of triangles in the fifth figure. 
and we figure out after that that if we observe carefully, then the figure numbers and the number of triangles are related with the relation that they are square of the number of figure number, correct? So we can say, let n be the figure number or the term number, and n square will be number of triangles in that figure. You get the idea. So if the figure number is one, in that case, we have one triangle. If it is two, we have two square, which is four triangles. If it is three, then we have three square, which is nine triangles. And for the fourth, it should be 16. For five, it should be 25 as it is. It works. So that brings us to the most important point of this particular video. Do you see how easy it becomes now by using kind of a formula n square to find the answer. If I say how many triangles will be there in figure number 100, he will say, well, it is 100 square. That's the beauty. Now, this n which we have introduced is what makes difference between arithmetic and algebra. Correct. So let's look into this. So first thing first, now the pattern rule for us, which I'm calling it a pattern rule, earlier we said A, let it be pattern rule B, that the number of triangles is square of the figure number, n squared. Now what is n? Well, n could have any value, correct? So we'll call it a variable. It could vary, n could be, n is not a fixed number. It could be one, two, three, four, five, hundred, two hundred, any number, correct? n is a variable. For any value of n, we have the number of triangles, which will be square of that n, correct? So that gives you kind of an idea of what a variable is. Variable is something which varies, right? Makes sense. Okay, now let's review. So this is an explicit pattern rule where the value is directly obtained from the figure number itself, right? Now, we have a simple rule which connects the figure number with the number of triangles. For any value of n, the number of tiles, or in this case, the triangles, can be easily calculated. Perfect. So again, if you have to answer part C, the number of tiles of the figures in fifth term will be 5 square. That gives us 25. And in the 20th term, it will be 20 square, which is 400. Correct? Now, important thing to note here is that n, which we have used here is actually a symbol for the term number or a figure number in this case, right? And we'll call this as a variable since it does not really have a fixed value. It's not a numeral, right? It does not represent any particular number. It could be any number. So it's a variable, right? So it can take any value for the figure number to find the solution directly. That's the whole idea. So we have introduced you to n, which is a variable. It could have different values, but it helps you to find the solution directly. Do you see that? Now, let's take another example. Now this time, example number three is a real life situation. We'll see how do we model a real life situation and find a solution. Anna is interested in the growth pattern of sunflower plant. She started recording the height of the plant since it was one feet tall. Every week, it grows by six inches. Write pattern rule for the height of the plant. Find the height after five weeks. When will the plant be at least six feet tall? Okay, well, we are using two units. One is feet, one is inches. You should know how are they related. Well, one feet is 12 inches. Okay. Now, since uh, we are one feet tall, you could convert feet into inches or you could convert inches to feet, whatever is suitable or easy for you. Well, multiplication is easier. So I prefer to convert feet to inches, solve the question, and then when we get the answer, we can again convert the inches to feet by dividing by 12. Does make sense, right? So that is kind of strategy which we have to think about 
be even before we start answering the question. Now, since it is finding a pattern rule, it's a good idea to always have a t-chart ready. In a t-chart, we normally give the term numbers on one side and then what we are trying to find out on the other. So the second column here is the height, and we have mentioned that the height will be in inches. Right? So that means we are going to convert this unit. We'll always begin with the initial. What is the starting point? Right? Start at 1 feet. 1 feet means 12 inches. 12 mentioned 12 here. So initially, we have 12 inches. Every week, the plant is growing by 6 inches. That is, we have to add 6 to get the next number. So after one week, 12 plus 6 will be the height of the plant. And after the second week, it will be 6 more, right? So it will be 12 plus 6 plus 6. Likewise, every week, we have to add 6 more to the height. You see the idea. Now that will give you a kind of a rule which you can write as an answer for part A. Correct? So the strategy for us is straightforward. Strategy here is, first, convert the initial height of the plant in inches. So 1 feet is 12 inches, which I have mentioned here. Now, start with the initial height and add 6 each week to complete the T chart. So that is what we were trying to do, right? Now, while you do this, it becomes very cumbersome to write so many sexes, right? Well, you could do one thing. You could also write this as 12 plus 1, 2, 3 earlier. So this time will be 4 sexes. So 4 sexes. You see, repeated addition is multiplication. That is important to understand. So 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 3 times 6. 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 4 times 6, right? 4 sixes when you add. So that helps, right? So, and you can correlate, right? So when it is 5, it is 12 plus 5 times 6. You see how easy it becomes now to figure out a pattern rule. That is key while solving such real-life questions. So you need to observe how many sixes are being added to the initial value after each week. And our observation is very clear. Number of weeks and number of sixes added is same. Correct. And therefore, we know that we can now give a formula. We also understand that repeated addition is multiplication. And therefore, we have written it in the short form. 12 plus 4 times 6. 12 plus 5 times 6. Correct. So, now, we can actually find the pattern rule. Why don't you take a moment and write down the pattern rule now, correct? And then answer part B, which is find the height of the plant after five weeks, which is calculating this value, correct? Now, when you calculate this value, 12 plus 5 times 6, 5 times 6 is 30, 30 plus 12 is 42. You need to, once you write 42, it is in inches. If you want to write the answer in feet, you have to divide by 12. You get the idea? So don't forget that. So what you get here is 12 plus 5 times 6, which is 30, and you get this as 42, and now 42. This is in inches, right? You have to divide this by 12 to get the answer. You get the idea, right? So 12 goes 30 times, 3 times, which is 36. 4 times is 48, so it is in between. So 3.5 feet. So you can convert to feet. Write the answer in the correct units. Perfect. So anyway, we did get this concept. Now here is another concept to look into, which is it is increasing at the rate of 6 inches per week. Rate. You understand? Like if the cost of a shirt is $10, for example, then 5 will cost 5 times 10, $50, correct? So that is the concept of rate. Now, it is increasing at the rate of 6 per week. So, in 5 weeks, it will be 6 times 5. It is increasing from the initial amount. So, you have to add the increased amount to the original amount to get the right answer. And that is how you could also get explicit formula. Right? But remember one thing. 
when last time we got the explicit formula. In that case, we also defined a variable. Last time it was n for the number of figures, right? This time it is w for weeks. So you could define w as the number of weeks and then relate that and find out the rule to find the height, to get the height. So you could describe this pattern with recursive formula and also with explicit formula. Well, if you write down the explicit formula, part C will be very easy for you. When will the plant be at least six feet tall? Correct. You may have to estimate to do it. And then now I will also show you how do we solve it. Correct. Let's move on and look into our solution. Well, you have learned this part. That is, in the beginning, we converted the units, right? And then we got one feet as 12 inches. Every week, we added six. That means repeated addition is multiplication. So after four weeks, it is four times six is added to 12. After five weeks, five times six is added to 12. And we get our answer for five weeks, which is calculated here, right? Now, anyway, so when you do uh, the pattern rule for, you get 12 plus six times W, and for the fifth week, W is five. So you know the value which you could place W with. W is a variable, it could take any value. Since we want to know the height after five weeks, we'll put W as five. So we get 12 plus six times five, which is 12 plus 30 as we calculated, 42. When you divide by 12, you get 3.5 feet. So 42 inches or 3.5 feet. So we've done that part. Now part C is, when will the plant be at least six feet tall? So you want to make it six feet tall. It is already five feet tall. That means it is already one feet tall. So that means five more feet, right? So go with the logic. To be six feet, plant should grow five feet or five into 12, 60 inches, right? So we need additional growth of 60 inches. It is growing by six inch per week. That means 60 in 10 weeks. And so we got the idea that in 10 weeks, it will be six feet tall. That is how we're going to solve it. Very critical, correct? So in such questions, you need to communicate. You need to explain your thinking. And there are marks for that in the test. So keep that in mind, perfect? You can actually correlate this example with the concept of cost and rate also, right? Okay, let's take the next example. Well, before going there, let's kind of review what we have learned so far. Well, we talked about recursive and explicit pattern rules, right? So what are these? Recursive and explicit pattern rules. So let's look back and analyze the pattern rules developed in the earlier two examples. In example two, we found that the number of triangles can be related with the figure number. We found pattern rule A, which is the recursive pattern rule, as start at one, add three, then add two more each time. Well, this is definitely called a recursive pattern rule for which we need to know the initial value along with the information of how it continues, right? To find the next number, we will need the previous number also. Now, pattern rule B was the explicit pattern rule, where the number of triangles can be directly calculated as square of the figure number. So we introduced n, which is being called now as a variable. This variable represents the figure number. And the number of triangles is square of n. Simple as that. Do you get the idea? Okay. So this is an explicit pattern rule which provides direct solution because of the variable n. Right. Now, in example number three, we kind of followed the same system. We need to find the height of the plant after each week. The recursive formula was start at 12, add 6 each time. However, this is not a very efficient way of writing a formula since finding the height after, let us say, 10 weeks 
is not so simple, right? Okay, but we could also write explicit pattern rule in the form 12 plus 6 W, where 12 is the initial height when we started to measure the height, it was 12. And then the rate of 6 per week, that is 6 W. Do you understand? Rate of 6 per week. W being the number of weeks, 6 W. You get the idea. How do we get this formula? Easily, correct? Once you have the recursive formula, in that case, substituting the value of W helps us to find the height of the plant at the end of every week, correct? So this is kind of very important. So height of the plant after any number of weeks can now be easily calculated by using the formula derived in the explicit pattern rule. So you see, using variables, we could derive the formulas and then use them to find simple solutions. You get the idea, right? Now, this brings us to the end of first part in which we have an assignment for you. I'd like you to pause the video here, copy the assignment. You need to submit it in a couple of days. So the question here for the assignment is, I have 13 coins in nickels and dimes. Nickels means 5 cents, dimes means 10 cents. So I have 13 coins in nickels and dimes. The coins have total value of $1, 10 cents. How many of each coin do I have? Simple. How many of each coin do I have? So I have 13 coins in all. The only denomination here is nickels and dimes, where nickels means 5 cents, dimes means 10 cents. And the total value of all these 13 coins is $1.10. You need to figure out how many nickels and how many dimes do I have. I hope you understand the question, right? So take a break, try to solve this question, and then we'll move forward, okay? Here is the hint for you. The hint is you need to define the variables. Well, you could define one variable or two variables. Think about it. We don't know the number of dimes. We also don't know the num number of nickels. You might need two variables. Well, it really, really depends on how you solve this question. So first thing is define your variables in solving the problem and explain how the number of coins and the value of coin is related. That will help you to get the right answer. You get the hint, right? So that is the hint for you. Let's move forward. This is an assignment, a homework assignment for you. So now we have come to the middle part of this where we have kind of understood where does the arithmetic stops and the algebra takes over? It is this variable n, which we call earlier, and w in the second example, which makes all the difference. You get the idea, right? So introduction of this variable is the difference between arithmetic and algebra. So therefore, we have actually connected both the things. Connection is important since Whatever we learned in arithmetic, all those skills can now be applied to algebra also with one addition. We have also a variable, right? So we'll figure out how do we treat this variable and still apply all what we had learned in arithmetic. You get the concept, right? So that is the bridge which we have already come across. So we'll take another example just to see how easy and simple it is. Well, you know, area and perimeter of a triangle can be calculated from its length and width, right? What is the area of a rectangle? Length into width, correct? And what is the perimeter? Well, there are two lengths of the same side, two widths, so it is two times length plus width. Well, you know these formulas, right? So in fact, you had been using algebra for a very long time, correct? Length into width, you knew this area, right, in the primary school also, right? Now, so, so variable is not really a new thing. If you think about it, you know about it, right? So we know that area and perimeter of a rectangle are related with length and width of the rectangle. Area is the product and per perimeter is twice the sum of length and width. 
in real life situations, we may need to find missing dimensions. What I'm trying to say here is always, it is not that we are given length and width and you have to find the area. Sometimes we have to do the reverse. We are given some conditions and we have to find what is the length and what is the width. While in arithmetic, it becomes very difficult to solve such real life situation questions. But in algebra, it's very easy. You get the concept, right? So the variable makes all the difference and will help you solve problems easily. So let's move forward. To model and solve such problems where you need to come back to what the length and width would be, the unknown values which you don't know can be represented by some symbol called variable. You get the idea. Since you don't know, you can write it as a variable. Well, I don't know what this length is. So let L be the length. I don't know what should the width be. So we'll write let W be the width. And then we'll say, well, area is length into width. And the parameter is twice sum of length and width. You get the idea. So even when you don't know, you can begin to solve your question. That is what it is. So to model and solve such problems, unknown values can be represented by some symbols called variables. So introduction of variables to our skill of arithmetic is the foundation of algebra. You get the idea. So this variable, when added upon to whatever we knew, brings us to the next level, which we are calling as algebra. Clear? Right. Based on this, let's have example number four which says, find area and perimeter of the rectangle width. In part A, we have given you the length and the width, which is 4 centimeters is the length, 2 centimeters is the width. And therefore, you can find both area and perimeter. Not a problem. But in the second case, we say, well, L is the length, W is the width. We have unknown values, the variables themselves. Now, this gives you a foundation for solving problems using variables. So what we have introduced you to is we began with unknown values, right? So solution for three is straightforward. We know area is product of length and width, and therefore four times two is eight. Units when multiplied gives you centimeter squared. And for the perimeter, it is two times four plus two. Four plus two is six. Six times two is 12 centimeters is the perimeter for part A when length and width are given as 4 and 2 centimeters respectively. Okay? Now, in the second case, we don't know. So, we wrote L and W. Well, area, we could only write as an expression L times W perimeter, another expression, 2 times L plus W. We do not have a value. What we have is the general formula. You get the idea. Because the value for length and width was not given to us. So, when we were solving arithmetic related questions, we had a fixed value. Now, when we solve algebraic questions, we may not have a fixed value. We may land up with the formula. Like in previous cases also, you remember n squared? But now, if you put some value to n, n is a variable, we'll get the answer. Similarly, here, length and w is there as l and w. We do have a formula. Now, if length and w, length, and width are known, we can substitute the values and find the answer. Perfect. And so we get a formula in algebraic solution. So what we note here is that L and W are unknown numbers whose value can vary and therefore are called variables. General formula derived using variables provide flexibility in real life problem solving application. You get the idea. Earlier also, we got a formula. Those were also real life situations. And substituting the value for the variable helped us to find the equation. So that brings us to algebra. Algebra is the branch of mathematics that deals with variables, numbers, and various operations on them. So Numbers and operations were already there in arithmetic. We added variable to bring it to algebra. You get the idea. So that is how we find 
solution of real life situation by assigning some variables. These variables normally are lit written in lower case letters. So that brings us to one level. We'll take a halt here. And uh, before we go, here is a very interesting project for you. In this project, <coughs> you have to understand the question, use the skills learned in this video, and then submit your solution. Is that okay? So I'd like you to take the picture of this particular page, go through it, or copy the question itself. The project here is based on arithmetic to algebra link, which we had been discussing. The question is, a square-based pyramid is formed by each face having a pattern of equilateral triangle as shown in the figure. Find the surface area of the four faces of the pyramid if there are 21 triangles in the bottom row. Assume each triangle with perimeter of 3 meters. Correct? So that is your project. It could be extended and which is make a model to support your solution, correct? Now we have a marking scheme for this particular project. We like to understand what is the strategy which you adopt to solve this particular question? How do you develop the explicit pattern rule and how do you calculate the exact value of required, which is in the square base pyramid, let's try to understand square base means that this is all the sides are equal, right? That is your base, right? Pyramid means there will be one point to which all these sides will be connected, right? Kind of like this. Now, all these faces, these are four faces, right? These four faces are what we're talking about. Do you see that? Each face is a triangular face, but they have a triangular pattern also. So these are the triangles which will be formed here. Do you see that? Kind of like this, right? But these number of triangles are 21 in the base. So when you have 21 here, how many triangles will be there in each face? That will give you some idea. We also know that each triangle has a perimeter of 3 meters. Perimeters means each side is 1, 1 meter. So the sum of three sides is 3 meters. With that in mind, I'd like you to find the solution of this particular question. I hope you find it interesting and useful. We'll continue with this lesson next time. You need to submit this particular project before that. We'll also discuss the solution of this project. As a hint, I've also given you what is the area of equilateral triangle? The formula is that the area of equilateral triangle is square root 3 over 4 a square. You can use calculator to find a decimal equivalent value. Or you may write the answer with square root 3. Perfect. So we'll end our class here. I hope you find it interesting and useful. Feel free to write your comments, share your views, so that we can also address those questions in our next meeting. Thanks for your time and all the best.